talking since Mother's Day about the modern family, how to do life together in this techno-saturated modern city that we live in called Montreal, where technology is everywhere. We want to talk today about the impact of technology. This is going to date me, maybe it's going to date you as well, but remember those three precious words when America Online existed? I was back, I was a sophomore in university, so it was my second year of university, and I was in Virginia at the time, and I was so excited because I got my first personal computer. And a personal computer back in those days was like a monitor that was as big as your TV, and the fan was constantly humming and churning. It's like, it felt like you could power the entire dorm, right? It was this massive thing. You didn't actually have a desk left after you put your desk top on top of the desk. Remember those days? And I was so excited because I got this free trial, this 30-day version of America Online, and those, that sweet three-phrase word that happened as you hear that modem connected, that 14.4K, I don't even know what that means, Jason, but it's, you know, it, that means slow, and it's like, you know, and that, that takes three minutes to connect to the internet, and those are magical words, you've got mail. You've got mail. That was such an exciting word back in the day. When you got an email, you were high-fiving your friends. You were doing a tiptoe. You were like, man, I am popular in e-space, whatever the heck that means, right, in cyberspace. And, but it was this, like, magical time because you, could, you knew that you were somehow connected to something that you didn't understand and way beyond your own city, way beyond your own area. And it was like this potential and, and that you were connected to everybody, this, this amazing idea. When's the last time... You did a toe touch. When's the last time that you jumped up and down when you got an email? It's been a while, right? In fact, if you're not old like me, you probably never understood what it's like to have a dial-up experience and, and, how, and how patient you had to be just to get online. In fact, kids these days, if you're born after the 19, you know, mid-1990s, early 2000s, you've never known an existence without the internet, and aren't you blessed, Right? You've always been able to have an instant on connections, Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 4K. It goes on and on and on. It's interesting because, as I was mentioned this last week, I was in the Silicon Valley where all the hubs are created. So Facebook is, is there, and Apple is there, and Google is there, and all the great tech companies are in that window between San Francisco down to San Jose, and all the real estate is being purchased and being bought up, and so people are having to move to different places because all the companies are taking over all the real estate. But it's amazing that we live in such a connected world, isn't it? That today is not an, just because it, some of you are getting nervous, like, hey, I wonder what he's going to say today. This is not an anti-technology message. We love technology. We embrace technology. We just talked about the app. It would be very hypocritical for us to say we were anti-technology. Of course, just like money and a lot of things, it can be used in great things. It can be used in dark side things, but this is not an anti-technology message. But I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures that might be familiar if you are a modern family like this. So if you're a, a spouse and you're in bed together and you both have a, a smartphone, this might be what your experience looks like. You're turned away from each other and you're glued to your smartphone. The white light is kind of lighting up. It's magical. It's calling to you. Candy crush. Facebook, Instagram, it's so powerful. Let's see another picture. Does this look like anyone's dinner conversation? Everybody's connected to something. Someone's doing a PSP, someone's on a tablet, someone's on a smartphone. And I want to show you this last picture. This was a photographer that actually removed devices from the picture. So he showed us what it looks like, how absurd it looks to take the device out of our hands and to show what it actually does to a relationship. And he had all kinds of different pictures. This is just one example of how a sp a spouses, so a husband and a wife, are turning away from each other, and they're connected and so absorbed into this that they're ignoring each other. And so again, this is not a, an anti-technology message, but this is really just a, a time for us to do a checkup together. And it's times like this when we can actually get away from technology, we can get away from the busyness of life, get away from even the busyness of our apartments, and and just ask some questions. Ask some questions of the good of technology, but also talk about some of the dark sides of technology. Because part of the modern family experience is that we have to figure out what we're going to do with these things. We have to figure out what we're going to do with tablets and TVs and PSPs and Xboxes and Playstations and on and on and on. I have a couple of statistics about our internet usage and our screen time. 
the first is this, is that between the ages of 5 and 12, this is, a, a, this is a research that was done by the American Academy of Pediatrics as well as BBC. Between the ages of 5 and 12, the average kid spends 6.5 hours on a screen. So this is like elementary kids. This will be about kindergarten until, let's say, grade 4, grade 5, grade 6. So about six, six and a half hours per day. Now our M514 students who are now meeting in the other room across the, the way, this is a 13 to 19-year-old year, gap. And here's what these same researchers discovered, that approximately eight to nine hours a day, they're attached to a screen. So it might be a smartphone, it might be Netflix, it might be a, a gaming system. And that doesn't even include the time that's spent in the classrooms. Because many of our classrooms are now wired up with smart boards and iPads and and things like that. So that's, when you think about it, that's a third of our day is spent in front of screens. Now, if we continue that age group from 19 plus, what would your score be? How many hours a day would you say that you are connected to this thing or to another thing or to the other thing or to the other thing? And so today we just want to ask some questions in this modern family li life that we live in, in Montreal in 2017, where we have this instant on Wi-Fi available 4K experience where it just is, it's just there. It's, it's there in a coffee shop. It's there in our house. No matter where we are, we can be connected to anything, anywhere, at any time. And there's a couple of things that, that companies like Apple, companies like Samsung, companies like Google and Facebook, they're, they're kind of promoting things that we have to kind of step back sometimes and wonder to ourselves, is that really true? Here's a couple of things that I believe that are being promoted. It's it's that companies like this, they want us to believe that technology will automatically improve our life. That more technology, more access, higher definition is automatically going to improve our life, and it's ultimately good for us. That the more connected, the higher the resolution, it's ultimately good for us. That's kind of one of the things that we see through the messaging. And so that's why there's this lineup outside the Apple store anytime a new device comes out, right? Because why? This is good for you. This is good for your life. And if you don't have it, you're missing out. A second message maybe that's being promoted is that, that everything that is new is better. And everything that is old is obsolete. And so there's this bias towards new books. There's this bias towards new ideas. There's this bias towards new technology. And its underlying message is that anything that is five years old or 10 years old or, God forbid, 20 years old, those ideas are obsolete. And I was actually reading a blog of a, a gentleman that's in the publishing industry, and he says that there's such a bias towards new books that after 30 days, the new books are being promoted and the other ones are getting thrown into the recycle bins. So even books that are 30 days old without that market share and without getting snapped up immediately – if they don't get bought immediately, they just basically disappear because there's a bias towards what is new and a bias against things that are old. I think underlying message also is that technology is only about what is good. More access, more information, connected like never before. But we never hear the dark side of the technology. We never hear about the, the marriages that are being split up. We never talk about the, the horrors of pornography or kids that are getting onto this stuff because they're getting connected to things that they shouldn't be seeing at early ages. And so that's never a part of any commercial, right? We, we just show you the good things, but we don't... Act a message like this, we want to sort of ask ourselves the question, what, what's the stuff that we're not paying attention to that's not part of that messaging? We're watching it, and we're looking at it. We're connected like never before. Finally, I wanted to show you this, that when it comes to Facebook usage... 2.7 times more depression for people who are regular Facebook users than those that are casual even, or those that don't, aren't on Facebook at all. So without us, we're all in the same boat, right? Like anyone not on Facebook, if you are, that's awesome. So you guys are not depressed. That's amazing. But why, why, let's ask ourselves the question, why is there more depression with Facebook? Part of it is because we're showing the highlights of our life, aren't we? How many people are out, out there on Instagram or Facebook and doing the duck face when you've got sleep in your eyes and you've got bedhead, right? Never. You're showing the picture when you get to go to Venice and you're, you're eating at a cafe and you show the pictures of when you're going to Disneyland and how amazing it is and you're like, man, my life stinks. I'm in, 
my kids are yelling, and I, I've got, I haven't changed my clothes since yesterday, and you, you, you kind of look at yourself, and you look at everyone else. Everyone else is having a good time. It's because we show the highlights of our life, and we think to ourselves, well, my life's not very good, right? So it leads to depression. Amongst teenagers, it leads to more negative emotions and kind of lower self-image. And so again, this is not a, an anti-technology message, as it is trying to discover what, what does wisdom look like with all of these devices, what does wisdom look like living in this modern world where access is available anytime, anywhere, any place? What is that doing to our souls? What is it doing to our minds? What's it doing to our relationships, to our marriages, to our kids? I want to talk about that today. You know, this is something that I looked really hard into the Word of God this week. And um, I was pretty sure that I found the word Facebook in the book of Exodus, but... Um, I was mistaken. It didn't say Facebook. It said plagues. Um, and then I was looking for the word Google in the book of Acts, and lo and behold, that didn't exist either. So for some reason, none of these tech companies are mentioned in this ancient, timeless truth. But you see, the Word of God is more than, it's, it's more than a, a historical book, and it's, it's more than something that's taken place in the past. In fact, the Word of God is said to be living and active. It's supposed to be helpful for our lives today. And so we want to ask that question, in light of what's happened, in light of our devices, in light of everything that's available to us, what, is, what would God say to us about how to negotiate marriages and life as a single adult? As we're thinking about marriage, we're thinking about kids down the road, what do my habits say about me now? And what has to change in light of what God says? In 1 Chronicles 12.32, there was a list of the kind of people that King David was looking for. He was about to take leadership in the nation of Israel. He was about to become the king, and he was looking for these certain people. And in this, in this sphere of looking for loyal people and mighty warriors and people who were very fiercely dedicated to his nation, there was a verse that talked about the men of Issachar in First Chronicles verses, um, chapter 12, verse 32. And listen to this. It says, these men of Issachar were men who understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. And I think with all the messages that we ingest, pictures, video messages, audio messages, personal messages, we're absorbing messages, thousands of images every day. And whatever the companies are sending to us, whatever advertising telling us, even whatever people are talking about around the workplace, we have to always ask the question, what does God say about those messages? Because otherwise, we're just absorbing everything, and we become like everything else. But King David was looking for people who understood the times that they were living in. And isn't that such an important thing in our lives? Where Google and Facebook and Apple aren't mentioned in the Word of God, but isn't it so true that if we want to have the kind of marriage, the kind of kids, the kind of family, even the kind of home life that we want, we have to ask tough questions. Tough questions about what the messages are out there. I did some research this week, and you guys will be blown away, okay? So are you guys ready for this? I looked up the definition of the word device. Earth-shattering stuff. Like, how many people got to church this morning that I can't wait for someone to tell me what the word device means, right? Hands are going up everywhere. I can see it. Thank you for your hands. God bless each and every one of your hands. Just kidding. I looked up the word device, and here's what the definition of the word device means. It's a thing made for a particular purpose. Now, doesn't that just leave your jaw on the throne? Like, it just, it just drops to the floor. A thing made for a particular purpose. The question is, what purpose does this serve? And if it's your Netflix at home, or if it's your iPad, if it's your PSP, if it's your Xbox, if it's your PlayStation, if it's any other screen in your house, if it's a device that does something, well, what does it do for you? What does it do for your emotions? What does it do for your physical life? What does it do for your relationship life? And how is it affecting your soul? It's a good question, isn't it? I was reading a book on the plane called The Power of Full Engagement. And it was talking about how easy it is for us to get distracted because we have these screens and we have this, all kinds of different things vying for our attention and it requires us to be laser focused in order to be productive, in order to get what we want to accomplish out of a week. And I came across this one sentence that really stopped me in my tracks and I think has really great implications for today's talk. It says, he said this, that which you can't fast from owns you. 
So anything that we can't stop doing actually owns us. Food, what we do with our time, and if it's a device, we have to ask ourselves, which one's the device? Is this the device or am I the device? Because if the device is owning me, then I become the device and this becomes the user. Interesting. And if you forget anything else, again, not rocket science, but if, if these are connected devices and if these are things around us always vying for our attention in bed or at the breakfast table or at lunch or at dinner table or if it's a thing that we kind of find ourselves doing for multiple hours every day. We either own our devices or our devices own us. These are actually in our pockets and we can decide when to turn them on or they actually drive our relationships, they drive our time, they even drive our emotions. So let's ask some hard questions today, can we? In the book of Ephesians, Paul was writing to a group of people who were living in a modern city at their time. He was living in Ephesus, around modern-day Turkey. And these are a group of people who were children of God. They were people that had said yes to Jesus. They had received the forgiveness of God through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And so these were Christian people, people that had, were followers of Jesus, living in a, in a culture and a time when most people weren't celebrating those things. They were living in a time when there was other technology vying for their attention. They were living in a time when most of the other people were worshiping idols and were eating things that were really not supposed to be done as a follower of Jesus. There was a, a rhythm to life. There was distractions and messages, just like we face, that Paul was observing, that the Ephesians were observing. And so even though Google and Facebook and virtual headsets aren't mentioned in the Word of God, I believe that there's an amazing passage in the book of Ephesians that Paul would speak to us today. If Paul was here today and knowing the distractions that we have, and if he knew the opportunities that we had, he would say this to us in light of this modern family, this, these modern times in which we live. And he said this in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, Be very careful. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Look at what he says here. Making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So Paul is saying this. He says, in this modern city and in these modern times, when you're getting messages from everyone and from every, every direction, we have to decide which messages are from God and which messages we have to leave on the side. Paul's saying, first of all, be very careful. When he's, he's painting a word picture, in the original language, he's painting the picture of two different paths. And he's saying that we have the choice. We can walk the path that everybody else is walking. We can absorb the messages that the marketers and the advertisers and what everybody else says is good for our, our marriage and for our souls and for our kids. Or we can choose to walk the narrow road. We can choose to walk the pathway that God has for us. And it all comes down to this word, wisdom. It's, it's looking with God's eyes at what's available. It's looking at the opportunities and the resources and the kind of life that we ultimately want to have. Just as a quick commercial break, next week, we're going to be talking about how important it is as a family. Whether you're a single adult and one day you want to be married and you want to have kids, it's so important that we have a mission statement as a family, that we define from the very beginning what kind of marriage we want to have, what kind of kids we want to have, what kind of home life we want to have. So that's going to be talking about next week. But, but Paul is saying today that we, we can choose from two paths. He says, be very careful because you have two options. You can walk the path of all these different messages or you can choose to look at it with God's eyes and to choose to reject certain messages and to reject certain opportunities in order to stay on the path of God's best for you. Secondly, Paul says to make the most of every opportunity. That's an interesting word in the original language in the Greek. It says to make the most is to intensively buy up the time. To take the precious gift of time, like sands through the hourglass. These are the days of our lives. Remember that? 
I might have watched a couple of soap operas growing up in the, in the summertime. So, sands through the hourglass. And isn't it true that time is, one of the, time is the most precious of resources, isn't it? We have in our kitchen, we have this amazing uh, foam board piece of, of uh, pictures of our kids growing up. And we have, Yancy did this awesome thing for a couple years ago. She ordered it online. It was this great deal on, on Twango, so we got a really great deal on it. But it was six pictures this way and six pictures this way. So 36 pictures of my kids. And on this corner, it started with my, my oldest, and there's a baby in this line. And then in the middle, I put the two of them together. And every time I go by there, there's, I get two different emotions. It's like a bittersweet emotion. Part of me as a dad, I, I look back and I kind of smile. I say, oh, man, look how cute those kids were. Like were, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding. I love my kids. But y- you look at those, the innocence of those faces and, and their blue eyes and just playing and they're negotiating. It just takes you back to those, those early days. But the other emotion I have is not just the, the sweet side, but it's like this thing of like, man, I feel like time is just evaporating through my fingertips. And if you're a, a mom or a dad today, you know a little bit what that's like, especially as they start into school. There, there's this sense that you can't slow down time. In fact, it's getting faster and faster and faster. And so Paul is saying, intensively buy up the time. It's the most precious of resources. And so Make sure you're walking that path and make sure you're redeeming the time. Don't let time waste. And I wonder what Paul would say to us as a husband and a wife with our smartphones on and moving away from each other in the bedroom instead of moving together. And I wonder what he would say as we're gathered around with a dinner table with devices on all the time and we're distracted from our time together. So Paul says, make the most because time is short. Moses said it in Psalm 90 that that time is one of the most precious of resources. Redeem the time. Make the most of every opportunity. Finally, Paul says the big why behind what he's saying. He's, He's saying, here's what to do, but he's saying, here's why. And he says, finally, that the days are evil. Now, there's two different reasons why he uses that word evil. We, we think of the, the negative side, which is true. It's, Paul is comparing throughout this whole chapter. If you go back and read Ephesians 5, he's talking about how we have this pathway of the world, and we have the pathway of God. We have this path of, of righteousness and of light, but we have this pathway of darkness. And there is, as, as Paul says in other books, that there is supernatural forces that are competing for our attention. And so even though we see these amazing logos from these companies and we see these messages, not everybody that's an engineer in those companies are out for good things. And not every message is good for my marriage. Not every message that my kids are receiving are good for their health. And so it's, it's looking critically at each message and it's asking the question, God, what would you say about that? What does wisdom look like for my relationship? How much time do I need without screens in my home to be peaceful? How much time do I just need to be still? Isn't that awkward? We're not used to stillness anymore. We, we don't take time just to think and to reply from our day. We, we reach for this when we get home, we put the TV on, and I, I do the same thing. This is a message for me. It's, we get, we're so wired in, we're so focused on this blue screen and what this stimulation is doing to our brains that we don't really ask ourselves a question often enough, what is this doing to my soul? What is this doing to my mind? What's it doing to my emotions? What is it doing to my marriage? What's this doing to this precious time I have with my seven and 10-year-old son? What's it doing? So Paul's saying, yeah, there is actually people that are out for evil. And one of the hardest things about technology, and I think you've heard me say this before, I've been doing research, especially about pornography, is that did you know that almost every driver of technology is related to the porn industry? That's why there's 3G. That's why there's 4G. That's interesting. Siri just spoke. Yeah, so Siri's alive. Thank you. I did not intend to do that. That's funny. Um, Back to a serious moment here for a minute. But every advancement of technology, from Wi-Fi to 3K to 4K to 4G to LTE to the high-definition screens, the 4K televisions, did you know that the reason behind that is because there's billion and billions of dollars of porn people that are driving that content. See, Apple doesn't 
really promote that as they're releasing a new iPhone. Uh, by the way, this is mostly used for, you know, we don't talk about that. But so, so there is an evil side to technology. There's a dark side. There's a great side to technology. That, like, we can talk about the, the version Bible app, for example, that millions and millions of people are now connected to the Word of God through their devices. We should celebrate that. We should celebrate that people are watching messages like this in places where they can't organize around a church because if they go out publicly and declare that they're a Christian, they will get beheaded. There are places in our world where people depend upon an internet connection to, to get an encouragement from the Word of God in places like Montreal even. We don't think about that. So there's a great side to technology. Don't hear me wrong. But Paul says not only is there an evil side, but the other word evil isn't just about darkness and the, the evil one who's ener energizing that, but he says... Another word for evil is the word useless. It's, it's a sense of emptiness. There's a sense that maybe a few minutes or maybe even a couple of hours, it's productive. Maybe you unwind and maybe you're like me that sometimes after a stressful day, all you need is a little bit of a sitcom, right? Anyone else can identify with that? It's okay. You can, I'm not going to... Okay, there's like one person. Okay, anyway, that's me. I, I, I'm a thinker and I get immersed in ideas and thoughts and sometimes I just need to unwind. But here's the funny thing. 30 minutes won't stay 30 minutes. It's just like those Lay's potato chips. You can't just eat one, right? So 30 minutes turns into three hours. I, I, don't, I don't even need to see any hands on that one. And it's the sense that evil not only just talks about the dark side, but it's talking about it's worthless, it's empty. And so how many of the six and a half hours that our kids are watching screens, how much of that is productive? How much of that is good for them? How much of that is actually maximizing time? And that's the question that Paul wants us to think about. As I mentioned, we were, I was in San Jose this last week, and I was talking to this church planter that helped start City Church, and th he's been a mentor to me, and it's, it was awesome because South Bay Church is now a church that has three different locations, so they have campus leadership in three different parts of their city, and it got me excited and dreaming about what's going to take place in our future. As we think about different cities, as we think about different locations and reaching new people, it got me so excited for the future of City Church, you guys. I can't, I can't wait for that. The best is yet to come for us. Do you believe that? So excited. And I was listening to him talk about the, the acquisition of a building in this place called Sunnyvale. And Sunnyvale is a little bit south of their main campus. And he, he was driving me around the neighborhood, and he said, Every, everything within six or seven square blocks has been purchased by two companies. Facebook and Apple have bought every business. They've, they've purchased small businesses. They've purchased old buildings, new buildings. There is literally no real estate available in that area because of two companies, Facebook and Apple. And so what that's doing, it's driving out local businesses. It's driving out people who can't afford the real estate anymore. And it got me thinking, again, about this word device and how Facebook and Apple and 4K and Wi-Fi and all this stuff, it's, it's literally taking time out of marriages. It's literally taking time away to be still. It's taking time away from kids and parents. And just as those two companies are, are eating up real estate, I feel like there's a, there's a time for us to ask a big question. How much time is okay? And what devices are okay? And when is it okay? And why is it okay? Because it's becoming smaller and smaller. Our, our ability to connect with our spouses, our ability to connect with our roommates, our ability to, to even just to be still for a minute just to be still for a minute so again i want you just to answer the question for yourself because you might be a person that can handle four or five hours of screen time a day but maybe for some of you you need to try to scale it back and it's one of those things that if we don't answer the question for ourselves it'll never happen but but paul wants to urge us today to intensively buy up the time to make the most of every opportunity don't waste your 20s. Don't waste your season as a, with a newborn or a toddler at home. Build into them right now. Build into your spouse. Build into your neighbors because time is the most precious of resources. And if we don't be careful, we're going to waste those opportunities. So here's three things. If you're taking notes today, here's three things I would encourage you to do. Here's some action steps, some handles that I can give you to to help you think about technology and what's my response to this? Because everyone has to have our own response based on what we've talked about today, but what Paul is encouraging us to do. The first is to take a technology log this week. So spend the next six days just observing how much time you're looking at your phone. 
It might take a while. I might have to use your phone to actually log how much time you're using on your phone, right? Go to the Notes app. Oh, I'm on my phone again. <laughs> so, so do a log. Just, just kind of walk around and how much time your kids are on, how much time you're on, how much TV you're watching, how many apps you're watching, which, which apps are you using more than others. Observe when it's the most popular time, when it's not being used, who's using it, where they're using it. Ask those questions. So just take a log. You know why that's such a powerful action step is because if you're trying to lose weight, for example, the first and probably the most valuable thing you can do is to take a log of the food that you're eating, right? Because if you're, your doctor said, you know, you need to lose some weight or this might turn into problems down the road, your doctor's going to say, I want you to take a log and I want you to tell me how many calories you're eating. Because if you're going to just ask the question and answer it, you would probably say, oh, I'm, I'm eating about 1,500 calories. And then you like, you look up how much that how many calories that donut at Tim Hortons cost? You're like, oh, that was 560 calories. Or that cheeseburger at, at Wendy's was actually 1,000 calories. And instead of 1,500 calories, you're actually eating 3,500 calories. Because we always underestimate how much we're doing things. We always think the best of ourselves. And this is an opportunity for us to kind of just look and say, well, maybe I'm not six and a half hours, but maybe I'm looking at it for four hours. And is that, is that healthy? Is that good for my marriage? Is that good for my kids? So take a log for the next six days. Secondly, devise a technology plan. Where is it okay to have technology in your house, and where is it not okay? When is it okay, and when is it not okay? What kind of sites, what kind of apps are okay, and which are things that I should delete from my phone, and which are things that I should not allow access to my children? One of the things that came up over and over again as I was reading different parenting sites and different parenting books this week is everyone universally pretty much said that kids should not have a TV in their bedroom. Kids should not be watching anything in their rooms with a closed door. And mom and dad, if you own the iPad, if you purchase the iPad, you better have the password for it. Now that sounds like, whoa, that's, that's pretty aggressive, but while you're paying the rent and while you're handing over the devices, those are your devices. If you can't get into your own kid's iPad, there's a problem. So, Decide which room is okay in my house. Maybe here's the common rooms where it's okay to be on a device, and here's where it's not okay. Here's the apps that are okay. Here's the apps that are not okay. You can look at it from between 6 and 7, but after that, we're going to cut it off. And you can actually program your router. I discovered this a couple weeks ago. You can program your router to kill technology in your house at a certain hour in your house. That's pretty awesome, right? So if your teenage daughter's not coming when you call them for dinner, just cut the Wi-Fi off, and they'll come running. Thank you for that laugh. But come up with a plan. After you look at the log and look at the hours, look at the where's and the why's and the how's, then decide as a, maybe you're a single mom, decide what's good for your kids. Decide with your spouse what's good for yourself, what's good for you, what's good for your kids. Finally, I would say this. The most important and the most valuable thing you can do as a parent is to have dinner with your kids at night. It's the most important Keystone habit. I'm going to talk about what that means in a second. But if you can do anything for 30 minutes, the most valuable thing you can do, I'm going to talk about why that is in a minute, but the most valuable thing you can do is to eat dinner together without technology. And if you live with roommates right now, you're not married, I would suggest this would be a good thing to, to try. Just have a community dinner. Take the phones away, take the iPads away, turn the TV off, turn the Netflix off, even turn the music off, and just be present together. Ask two questions. What was good about your day? What was hard about your day? Now, you're looking at me like, man, you must have, an ama you must have amazing kids that are giving you like paragraphs and paragraphs of information. If I can get five words out of my 10-year-old son, I've done an amazing job as a dad. So don't expect that this is going to magically transform your home and they're going to get along and that your two kids won't fight and be literally falling off the bar stools in your kitchen. No, it's going to be chaotic. There's going to be mustard flying everywhere. They're going to be yelling at each other. But... Just have this, this discipline in mind that you would carve out time without technology every night and at least spend a few minutes together without technology asking each other about your day. I read this book a while ago called The Power of Habit, and the author, Charles Duhigg, he talks about how habits are formed. It's really a fascinating study from the medical doctors about why we do certain things, why we, for example, every night at 9 o'clock we, we crave something sweet. Why is that? And he explains that there's a feedback loop, and there's something that 
there's a, there's a reward for that, and we train ourselves to want that, kind of like this old Pavlovian symbol. And he talked about in that book, though, these keystone habits. Keystone habits are things that affect multiple other habits. And he said, for example, the most valuable thing you can do in the area of health is to start exercising. As you start exercising, automatically you start looking for healthier foods. Automatically you start sleeping better. Automatically you start doing healthier things because you've chosen this one habit that affects other habits. It's called a keystone habit. In the area of families, in modern families, he says this, families who habitually eat together seem to raise children with better homework skills. How many people want that? Higher grades, amen. Greater emotional control, oh my goodness, and more confidence. Just the simple act of spending 30 minutes together or an hour together just being present with one another. I have a friend in Dallas when we were living there together. They had this bin in their kitchen. And after 6 o'clock at night, every device in the house got collected and got put in the bin. And after 6 o'clock, nobody was allowed to get it, even himself, for the rest of the night. That was the way that they answered the question for themselves. That was their technology plan. But what's yours? The simple act of just shutting off technology, the, the discipline of not letting this distract us, not letting this become the thing that rules us, is, is something that we have to think about. We either own our devices or our devices own us. So the last word is what Paul wants us to say and what Paul wants us to end on is this. Own your time. Your time is the most precious of resources. Own your time. Don't allow hours to go by binging on something that you ultimately don't even care about. Know that every day and every moment is a gift from God. You can either allow that to be vaporized into technology, into mindlessness, or you can choose every block of where your time is going to go. So don't go weeks without asking and answering the question, what do I'm doing with my time? And, and how is technology affecting that? So own your time. Own your time with your spouse. Own your time with your neighbors. Own your time especially with your kids because it is the most valuable resource and eternity is on the line. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the wisdom that you give us through this ancient text that's been written 2,000 years ago. And God, I thank you that we can identify with the problems that the Ephesians had, that there are images and there's messages that they were being sent just like we are. So, Father, I pray that your spirit, who is the spirit of wisdom, would give us wisdom of how we need to spend our time, how we should think about technology. God, we thank you for technology. We thank you that we're able to connect around the world, that we're able to promote the good news of Jesus Christ literally around the world with just a click of a mouse. But, God, I pray that we would also see the dangers of technology, that we would be aware of our own time and how we're spending that time and investing that time. God, I pray that this would be a wake-up call for us and that we would take seriously this challenge, that you would show us the areas where we need to change for the health of ourselves, for the health of our relationships and our kids. We pray in Jesus' name.